I think a big part of my notoriety in the think tank or public policy world has come from the mental disciplines that I learned as a hedge fund investor. When you're a hedge fund investor, as your, your best ideas are the ones that are contrarian, but that are right. It's not enough to be contrarian. You have to be contrarian and also right. Uh, that's <laughs> kind a, of important. That's kind of important. And how are you? How do you become contrarian and right? It involves being very, very data driven and evidence based, rigorously and ruthlessly empirical about the world. And it comes from that data driven discipline that I got from being a hedge fund manager, where I knew that the markets can be wrong longer than you can be solvent. And so you have <laughs> you have to have that courage of knowing that you're right, even when it feels like the entire world is against you. Welcome, everyone, to the Liberty Ventures podcast. My name is Alexander McCobin, general partner at Liberty Ventures, and I am so excited to be talking with Ovik Roy today. Now, your bio is extensive. I'm not going to read through all of it because, you know, no, it's because you're just an incredible guy. And right now you're the president of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. But as you list on your bio on the website, this is your fourth career. You've done medicine, uh, you've done investing, you've done politics, now you're into public policy, and I'm not gonna do nearly as good of a job explaining all of that. So before we get into our full conversation, I would love it, Ovik, if you could just provide your story for everyone. What's What have been those careers and what's led you to the work you're doing in public policy now? Well, it's kind of a don't try this at home uh, career trajectory, because. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in molecular biology at MIT. I, I was training to be a scientist um, to, you know, push back the frontiers of knowledge and make discoveries that would change uh, humanity. And then I decided I was too dumb to be a great scientist, so I decided I'd be a doctor instead. Um, and then uh, I realized that the world didn't really need me to be a doctor. Lots of other people wanted to be doctors, but there was this incredible revolution in biotechnology that was going on that I'd had a front row seat to because my dad was a, a, bi a biochemist. And I really wanted to be involved in that world. Um, and there were, unlike the, I, w I went to medical school in the 90s. And so this is the time of the, the first dot-com bubble. And I had been an early adopter of the internet. I just, I actually built one of the first 1,000 websites on the internet uh, for my old college paper at MIT. And, but I, I sat out the whole internet revolution because I was in medical school. Instead of dropping out like I should have and gone to the University of Illinois to join Mark Andreessen, uh, I instead just sat there in med school watching all my friends uh, drop out of school and go to dot com. So I'm like, okay, I missed that one, but, uh, but there's this biotech revolution that's coming that I have an inside track to because of the scientific training. And unlike a lot of software, there's intellectual property around drugs if you develop a new treatment for a disease. So let me try to get involved in that. So I actually applied to a bunch of venture capital firms. They all said, uh, we're not going to hire you because you don't have any operating experience at a biotech company. Those are the only people we hire right now. That, that's not true anymore, but this was in the late 90s. But there was a, a hedge fund uh, that was interested in my services at a then unknown investment firm called Bain Capital. And they were like, we can teach you how to read a balance sheet, but you cannot teach us bio biochemistry. So why don't you come work for us and figure out how to invest in these genomics companies that have multi-billion dollar market caps that we don't understand. So next thing you know, I was moving to Boston, learning what a hedge fund was. And um, I, it was an amazing uh, career. I, I never thought I would leave it, actually. I thought I was going to spend my life as an investor in biotech companies. I mean, I had, had a front row seat to all these incredible advances in medicine. I'd go to all these scientific conferences and, and be there when the scientists presented the new results from clinical trials and, you know, basically betting on whether these companies were overrated or underrated based on the quality of the, of the drugs they were developing. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience, and I loved it. Um, then Obama gets elected in 2008 and starts to put Obamacare through Congress. And I realized as a person who invested in healthcare companies that I had a lot of points of view on, on how this was not going to work the way that uh, Obama and his team claimed it was going to work. The problem was the libertarian and conservative community was not making those arguments. They were basically saying Obamacare is big government. It's a violation of the Constitution. It's expansion of the welfare state which are all arguments that libertarians already agree with. But if you are just an ordinary American who's struggling with the rising cost of health care, and one side is saying, I have this law bill called the Affordable Care Act that's going to make your health care less expensive. And you have the other side saying, I'm against big government. And you're just a non-ideological, ordinary person re seeing these two arguments. Who, which side are you going to pick? You're going to pick the side of the people who actually want to make your health care cheaper. And so I was sitting there saying, this is stupid. 
we actually need to explain why Obamacare is not going to make your health care cheaper. It's going to make your health care more expensive because the regulations are going to drive up the cost of the health insurance that you have to buy that you're not going to be forced to buy. So I started a blog not knowing what else to do. And it was just this kind of it took on a life of its own. So it just so happened that, um, uh, you know, I, I got connected to you, this kid named Yuval Levin, who was, was re, uh, restarting this this old journal called The Public Interest, it's National Affairs, and I sent him my resume and said, hey, I'd like to write something on healthcare for you. He's like, sure, send me something. And then uh, I was living in New York at the time, and I knew Rich Lowry socially uh, because I, I went to Yale Med School, and Yale has a lot of ties to National Review. And so um, uh, so Rich and I were out one day. He's like, hey, I hear you're sending something to National Affairs on healthcare. You want to write for us? We want, we want to start a healthcare blog. I'm like, sure. Next thing you know, I was writing for National Review. And then uh, an old buddy of mine who I knew from college who was the healthcare editor at Forbes, he said, hey, I like your stuff in National Review. Do you want to uh, blog for Forbes? I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then um, then the Manhattan Institute called and said, hey, uh, we love your Forbes and National Review columns. Do you want to be a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute? I'm like, I have a full-time job on Wall Street. I, I mean, I'm flattered, but like, I, I, I can't. I can't. I can't work for the Manhattan Institute. Um, but they're like, no, it's okay. Just put the Manhattan Institute at the bottom of all your blog posts and we'll pay you. I'm like, is that how it works? Uh, <laughs> so next thing you know, I was a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And then um, Mitt Romney, who was the founder of Bain Capital, and his team called and said, hey, we love your uh, your stuff. Can you, uh, can you help us design our health reform plan for the 2012 presidential election? Uh, and, uh, and, and entitlement reform. And I'm like, how many times do you get that call? Especially as just a a guy with an opinion and a laptop. I mean, I, I was I had no standing in the movement at that time. I was just a guy working on Wall Street. Um, the next thing you know, I was a uh, healthcare advisor to, to, to Mitt, and and um, um, that led to a lot of other things. And it's like one thing led to another. Then I thought after he after he lost, I thought okay, I'll, I I took a leave of absence from my Wall Street career. I'm like, this is very important. Trying to you know repeal and place Obamacare. Let me actually put all my energies into this. And then I'll either join the Romney administration or I'll go back to Wall Street. Um, but neither of those things happened because Mitt lost. And then instead of going back to Wall Street, people started asking me, now what should Republicans or conservatives or libertarians do on health care? And I, I said, we should embrace universal coverage, but show how private sector innovation and entrepreneurship can deliver it. Which seemed like an obvious thing to say, but I got a lot of blank stares from Republicans when I said that to them. So I realized if I didn't build out the plan, people in 2016 were going to run on the failed formulas of the past. So I took the next two years to build out a full-fledged, how do you achieve universal coverage using private sector entrepreneurship and innovation? And then the 2016 candidates started calling, and I never basically escaped. And then um, worked for Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, and Marco Rubio in 2016 on a broader range of issues than just healthcare, all of uh, public policy, including all domestic policy, foreign policy. I became the opinion editor at Forbes, so I started managing the entire public policy coverage at Forbes. And uh, uh, all the candidates I, I ever have worked for have lost. So uh, in 2016, after, after my candidates all lost, I'm like, well, what do I do now? And I, and I concluded that the thing that I'd learned from all these experiences, I, I learned a couple of things. One was that the um, that think tanks were really important. A lot of us have the perception, particularly in the business community, that think tanks are these kinds of, kind of they're basically like academics. They, they're, they, they, they sit there in their offices with their, surrounded by their books, and they write a bunch of white papers that nobody reads, and they basically have no utility in the real world. Um, but in fact think tanks are very, very influential because let's say Alexander McCobin is running for president and, you know, Kenji over here is behind the camera is your policy chief. And you say to Kenji, you know, Kenji, I want to solve the problem of uh, the student loan crisis, but in a free market way. Maybe Kenji is a super genius and can come up with a brilliant plan, but it's more likely that she's going to call the free market think tanks that you trust and look at the scholars that have worked at those think tanks on this issue, and then go from there and then synthesize from there what your plan could be. Something that would be credible, something that would address the counter arguments that you hear from the other side, all that kind of stuff. So think tanks actually are, are in this bottleneck of the distribution channel of ideas, where there are lots of people who might vaguely say, yes, let's have a free market solution to student loans, but there's maybe literally two or three people in the entire country, and maybe even just one, maybe even zero, 
who are taking that general philosophical point and turning it into a concrete idea that a politician can actually run on and enact into law. Believe it or not, in a country of 330 million people, I was the only one trying to build a free market plan for universal coverage. Even today, a lot of libertarians think, well, gosh, that you, you, you're, a, you're a communist if you want everyone to have health insurance. To which I respond, is it, am I a communist if I believe that free markets can ensure that every American has meaningful work? Am I a communist if I believe that f innovation can d deliver everyone a smartphone and a laptop at an affordable price? Free enterprise and economic freedom are the things that solve scarcity and create abundance in every other sector of the economy. And if we conclude that in healthcare that's not true, then we've accepted the premises and the philosophies and the values of the other side. And so the entire premise of my new think tank, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, is exactly this. Something that you and I, I know, take for granted, Alexander, but it's that all of the things that progressives say they want, more wealth, more opportunity, more opportunities to prosper for lower and middle income people in the United States around the world, these are things that are almost always best achieved, in fact, really always achieved, best achieved by economic freedom and the creativity, leaving, allowing people to be as creative and, and, and uh, inventive as they can be. The problem is that a lot of people in our movement often have the rhetoric of, leave me alone and let me keep my stuff. And so if you're trying to appeal to someone who's struggling, you say, my philosophy is leave me alone and let me keep my stuff, and you figure out how to solve your own problems. I can understand that as a philosophical premise, but at the end of the day, uh, for our movement to have the to have the political coalition it needs to appeal to young people in particular who are increasingly true believers in the idea that our economy should be inclusive and should have opportunities for everyone, we have to show that economic and individual freedom can be applied to the challenges that lower and middle income Americans face, people on the bottom half of the ladder. And so that's 100%. what that's what Free Up, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity is done to do. And that's what I've been spending the last seven years of my life doing. So that was a longer answer than I think you wanted. So I apologize for that. It is exactly as long as it needed to be, because there's so much for us to unpack in there. And as, as I said at the opening, it's so diverse. When people hear all the different things you've done in your life, they might think they're so disconnected and and to have a question. Is there a running theme for ev everything between them in your life or something that's maintained that unity? Or have you just been looking at different opportunities and saying, I'm going to tackle that one that's come up in your life? I'd say if there are two themes, there's two themes, I think. The first theme is that I am temperamentally a contrarian. Um, I'm If everyone believes X, my immediate kind of instinctive knee-jerk reaction is what is wrong with the conventional wisdom. And look, maybe nothing is wrong with the conventional wisdom. You have to have the intellectual discipline discipline to understand or appreciate when the conventional wisdom is right. But there's almost always something wrong with the conventional wisdom. And if, if you have that sort of, if, that, if that's like a tick in your mental process, like it is for me, if that, if that just bothers you, that there's this conventional wisdom and people are oversimplifying uh, their observations about the world in some way, uh, what is the what is the, the, the missing piece of the puzzle that could be an opportunity or could be a, an opportunity for contribution, whether it's contribution in the sense of intellectually in the context of public policy or whether it's as an investor, what is the thing that the market is missing about this particular company or this particular sector or this particular scientific discipline, or technological discipline? Um, and so I think that's been one um, one uh, one big trend in the sense that, you know, I'm, a, I'm the son of Indian parents and they're like, you should be a scientist or doctor and if you do anything else with your life you're you're basically you know you're a failure or you're putting yourself at risk and we don't agree with that and i'm like no i'm going to do this thing that almost nobody is doing which is i'm going to apply my scientific knowledge to uh investing in biotech companies um at a hedge fund which back then in the early 2000s <laughs> no one had heard of what's a hedge fund um so it was it was a lot of a lot of you know a lot of uh difficult conversations with my parents who really didn't understand what i was doing with my life and i think every point of the way you know, dropping out of the hedge fund business to work in public policy and then start a nonprofit, that's not a, a standard career path. Uh, but I felt like, um, you know, the problems that we have in this country are so big, particularly when it comes to the federal debt 
uh, that if we it, the threat to ordinary Americans happiness and prosperity and future potential is so great from the overwhelming and skyrocketing federal debt that we've got to solve these problems. And I think a lot of times in the think tank community, there's a pressure or a drive to say, you know what, um, I'm going to I'm going to notch a small win. Kind of think about it like the MVP of the think tank world is I'm going I'm to have some small win that I can then go back to my donor and say, hey, see, I won. I did this thing. Um, and so, you know, we're effect, we're an effective organization. We, we, incre we achieved this incremental win. And in the business world, that makes sense, right? Because if you have an MVP, if you have a small win, if you have a small product success that can grow and grow over time, you can build off of that. You can be profitable off of that. But in the think tank world, you actually have to use the opposite logic. Because the techniques that it, that you need to use to have a small win are very different from the techniques and strategies you need to have a big win. So, for example, if you want to achieve some small victory in a state that may be like all Republican or all Democrat, depending on your party, you can do that, right? Because you've got complete control over the levers of public policy. You can just go to that governor or that legislature and say, hey, we should do this. And if, if everyone's aligned, you can get something done, right? But if you want to fix Medicare, if you want to solve the federal debt, that, that strategy doesn't work. You've got to build relationships with Democrats and Republicans. You have to build an approach to public policy that can get broad public support that isn't going to be opposed by everybody because, say, you're throwing old people off, off a cliff or whatever, right? You've got to figure out a way to do these things where seniors, where lower and middle income people actually embrace the ideas and say, you know what, this is going to make my life better. And you're building the credibility with Democrats and Republicans, not needlessly alienating people because you think they're in the wrong party or they, they disagreed with you on some other tangential issue that isn't about the issue you're really fighting for. So you have to have a completely different approach to public policy advocacy if you're trying to solve the hardest, most intractable problems that the country faces. And so we built a think tank that is reverse engineered from how do you get 60 votes in the Senate to solve the biggest and most intractable problems in America. And that's a very different model than what a lot of other think tanks do. And again, not to criticize those other think tanks, they were founded in a different era to solve different problems. But this is 2023. We founded Free Up in 2016, and we're trying to solve these problems today that that previous um, generation of think tanks haven't been able to solve. I, I'm wondering if this approach that you're using at FreeUp now draws upon your lessons, either from your scientific, your medical, or your hedge fund days and how you solve problems then. It almost sounds very much like what hedge funds try to do with their businesses that you're applying to the think tank space now, too. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think, I think um, a big part of uh, my notoriety in the think tank or public policy world has come from the, the mental disciplines that I learned as a hedge fund investor. Um, when you're a hedge fund investor, as I mentioned, part of it is all that that contrarian, con the, your, your best ideas are the ones that are contrarian, but that are right. It's not, a, it's not enough to be contrarian. You have to be contrarian and also right. Uh, that's <laughs> kind a, of important. That's kind of important. And, and a lot of our friends in the libertarian community, they love being contrarian, but whether they're right or not, so, you know, that can be a mixed bag sometimes. But like, it's important to be contrarian and right. And how, are you, how do you become contrarian and right? It involves being very, very data-driven and evidence-based and empirical, rigorously and ruthlessly empirical about the world. Um, and in, in, in the context of biotech investing, that means going through the clinical trial data. And there may, might be a, a hot, hyped drug for Alzheimer's disease that has great phase two data that's been, it's been studied in 150 patients. And, and the patients who got the drug, they, they, you know, according to this test of their mental acuity, they, they, they sound like they're doing better. And everyone gets excited. And the, the stock goes to $2 billion market cap. Everyone gets really worked up. But then you notice that the study uh, didn't measure mental acuity in the right way. Or maybe the patients in the placebo arm versus the drug arm had a different baseline health status, or something else. You know, you, you di when you dig into the data and you become really statistically rigorous, you can often find that that something may look that may look like a positive result is actually not a positive result. And when I started doing work on public policy, uh, I found a lot of similar issues. So, for example, one of the big things that Obamacare did to expand coverage was expand Medicaid. Now, it's an open secret in the medical community that Medicaid is trash, that 
uh, that people who are on Medicaid have very poor health outcomes. In many cases, way, well, in almost all cases, worse than with people that, that than health outcomes for people with private insurance. And in many cases, they don't even do better than people who are uninsured, which is a shocking result. You'd think that with a half trillion dollars a year we spend on Medicaid, they'd do at least somewhat better, but they don't. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that that I won't bore you with right now. I wrote a book about it called How Medicaid Fails the Poor. But I, I, I basically started writing about this and writing about all the medical research, all the data that showed that Medicaid doesn't actually help people have better health outcomes. And, and the left went absolutely nuts um, because this is just blasphemy. But study after study continued to vindicate that argument. And so that that was one of the things that, that gave me notoriety. Another thing that, that happened was... Um, uh, during COVID, um, we started doing a lot of work at, at FreeOp in 2020, in early 2020, in the spring of 2020, to show that lockdowns were not going to work. In particular, that school closures were a com- were going to be a complete disaster because you could safely keep schools open without increasing the transmission of COVID. Because for reasons we still don't completely understand, but is has been uh, uh, validated over and over again by the data, the younger you are, not only do you become less sick from COVID and have less uh, risk of death, in fact, almost zero risk of death if you're really young, but actually uh, your uh, transmission of the disease to others is also extremely low. And this is a very counterintuitive thing because any parent who has kids thinks that's that's impossible. I get sick from my kids all the time. They all always bring these bugs home from school and I'm getting sick all the time. How could it be that COVID, if my kid gets COVID, he's not going to give it to me? But it's actually true that in, in most cases, if you're a young child, you are not transmitting COVID to adults. This has been true in every place that's been examined all over the world. And so you can reopen schools and not ha- increase the transmission. And everywhere where they kept schools open, and in almost every other country in the world where they did, there was not an increase in transmission. So we started writing about this in April of 2020, when the lockdowns were just getting started over here in the U.S., to show that this would be a tragic mistake to close schools. And uh, this was a highly contrarian idea in April 2020. Um, and I had, you know, leading public health officials, uh, names that uh, that are pretty eminent, uh, literally say to me, Ovik, you are going to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of children. You should be totally ashamed of yourself. What you're doing is incredibly irresponsible. But we're like, look, we've gone by the evidence. The evidence says this is safe. We, you know, yes, of course, we are we are predisposed to freedom and predisposed to keeping schools open, but we didn't argue for opening schools based on first principles of freedom. We argued for it based on it's safe to do that because that was how you're going to convince that non-ideological moderate to go along with it. Those governors who have to take the risk, who know that lives are on the line if they make the wrong decision. So we published this uh, this paper. Uh, the Wall Street Journal asked me to put a to write a full page version of it for uh, to actually a two page version of it for their weekend review section, uh, and then then the governor started calling and saying, "Hey, you know, can you help us reopen our schools?" And we got very busy, and we didn't help everyone. We weren't able to help everyone because there were a lot of kids in blue states where the teachers unions were able to block uh, uh, school reopening, but um, but we succeeded in a lot of places. We estimate or we calculated that there are 50 million kids. Who had in-person learning in the 2020 to 2021 school year in part because we were the ones who made the scientific case for reopening schools and the only ones who did. So even though we're a small think tank, we have 30 people, we have a two and a half million dollar budget, we uh, we feel like we've, we've done some useful work and it comes from that data-driven discipline that I got from being a hedge fund manager where I knew that, look, in the markets, you can be, you you can be you, the markets can be wrong longer than you can be solvent, and so you have you have to have that courage of knowing that you're right and and really always evaluating the new data as it comes in, but having that courage of your convictions even when it feels like the entire world is against you, and that uh, mental discipline has served me well in public policy. So it sounds like that served you well in many areas. And in the Liberty Ventures ecosystem, we're largely working with angel investors and startups in the early stage. And I feel like this is a different approach than a lot of angel investors or even entrepreneurs are thinking at that point and want to actually start applying this to them. So given your background and thinking about entrepreneurs, perhaps at an early stage, how can they apply this more data driven approach or mindset to getting their companies off the ground to scaling them up? Well, almost all successful entrepreneurs will tell you that 
you know, they, they have a very similar journey, right? Where most of the people who they pitch their idea told, uh, you know, to, uh, to say their idea wouldn't work, you know, um, they, they were, they, they feel like, am I, am I crazy to think that this could work? Um, and they have to kind of be convinced. They have to convince themselves, no, I'm not crazy. Um, I might be wrong, but you, know, you have to have that healthy knowledge of I might be wrong because that way you can adjust course if you need to. But you still have to have that, that belief in yourself and belief in your idea. And you have to have a good idea, obviously, as well. Uh, but also the discipline and the rigor about the world around you to understand if you are right, why you're right. And if you might be wrong, even partially, how to ad- adapt to that or adjust for that as you go along. Um, and so that's really important. You know, uh, you know I'm on, on the boards of some, some startups and, and, and continue to invest in that space myself. And I, I think that's, that's very important, right, is to, is to have that sense of, do I have a theory of the case? Do I have a clear product market fit? Do I have something I'm doing that either nobody else is doing it? Like, you know, when I was developing the health, free market health care plan that no one else, else was developing, literally no one else was working on that. Or maybe some other people are working on it, but I have a better idea. You know, or a better strategy. So you have to have, I think, that that courage of your convictions. You have to be very disciplined about the evidence. Hope is not a strategy. You really have to be. You have to be unsentimental about what the market thinks of your idea. I think that's one beautiful thing about markets: is you may you may think you have the most brilliant idea, but markets will tell you. Consumers or clients or customers will tell you whether whether your your idea is is good or not, or who your idea will really serve. And there are so many stories of you know, an entrepreneur that starts with a particular business plan or particular strategy. And then five years later, when you run into that person at a party, like, oh, yeah, how's that? How's that startup going? And they're like, it's completely different what they're doing now. But they're more successful because they figured out over that iterative process the thing that actually worked. You know, one thing I really am proud of with FreeUp is that when we started FreeUp in 2016, we had this theory that if you if if you laser focused on how to achieve progressive social outcomes, how to improve the lives of Americans whose incomes or wealth were below the U.S. median, using individual and economic freedom, using free enterprise, using technological innovation, you could appeal to both Democrats and Republicans and centrists. You could appeal to a broad swath of people. You could build credibility among a broad swath of people. And you could actually enact laws in, in, in difficult political areas. And the, the cool thing about FreeUp is that we've been doing it now for seven years, and we have more conviction today about that thesis than we did in 2016. In 2016, it was a theory. Today, we have validated proof in many different areas that this, this approach works. So I think that is absolutely invaluable. And want to bridge the connection between other people in the investing and entrepreneurial space and what FreeUp is doing. So obviously donating to FreeUp would be one way for people to get involved and support what you're doing. But is there another role for people in the investing or the entrepreneurial space to be involved in the kind of work that FreeUp is doing? Yeah. I mean, aside from donation, if there, if there are people you know who uh, who uh, would, you think would be interested in what FreeUp does and, and interested in supporting our work, that's always welcome. But aside from that, um, as a guy who comes from the investing world, who comes from the business world, who comes from the innovation world, I think one thing that um, I know firsthand is how important it is for people in the public policy community to hear from innovators. And I mean specifically innovators, because in the public policy world, the, the share of voice, the influence, comes from incumbents in the business world 99% of the time. So if you're a senator or a congressman or a think tank, who is playing the game of lobbying you or or try uh, offering you donations? It's almost always the big incumbent industries that know that if they tweak a regulation this way or tweak a subsidy that way, they can create a barrier to entry for innovators. Innovators almost always are too busy trying to survive and make their next payroll. They're not thinking about what's going on in Washington or at the state capitol, right? They're just trying to survive. And I get that. Mm. I get that. But the end result is you finally survive, and the obstacles you face, you get squashed like a bug by the AT&Ts or the Microsofts or whoever it is. And you know, not to say there aren't good people at AT&T and Microsoft trying to do important things, but almost always the lobbying shops for these big companies 
are trying to erect barriers to entry for competitors for innovation. They want to create a moat around their work um, in ways that are anti-free market. I think that is the thing that most entrepreneurs just pay no attention to. And I, I get why. I get why it's it's something that entrepreneurs uh, are just, it's not going to be top of their priority list. Survival is going to be top of their priority list. But if you are, if you don't have a long-term strategy around understanding the public policy environment that you're in and how that public policy environment is being affected by incumbents, you are, you're going to win the battle of survival, but you're going to lose the war of your ultimate victories. And so the, the, going back to your original question, which is how can innovators help us at FreeUp, it's through that. It's by giving us that feedback of, hey, you know, I'm trying to start a company in this area, and there's this dumb regulation that makes it impossible for me to do what I'm trying to do. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, and help us understand that. Because, you know, the Federal mm. Register is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages, and it's just like, you know, nobody has time to read the whole thing, let alone like even 100 pages of it. So unless we hear from the entrepreneurs who are running into these challenges, it's hard for us to, to know that this is something we got to fight for. Well, Ovik, I think that is a fantastic note to end on. But I have one last question for you that I want to ask, which is to provide context. I always come from the philosophy of giving first and that if you want to get value, you've got to give it to other people first. And it, that seems to be what you've actually done in your career as well, and especially your transition into public policy, thinking about what value you can create for others. And that's a great way to get introduced to people and to be able to do the kind of work you want to. So for anyone who's listening and says, this is very much aligned with what I believe in, this is what I want to support, or I want to help you out in some way, what can they do to come and support you, to volunteer, or to provide some kind of assistance for what you're doing? Well, I appreciate that, that Alexander. And, and yes, I totally agree. I mean, you know, I think if you come from the business world, you understand the value of, of how helping others is ultimately uh, the way you help yourself. Um, I'd say anyone who's listening to this podcast who wants to support our work, just drop me a line. My, my email is uh, avik at freeop.org, F-R-E-O-P-P.org. They can drop me a line, to drop me a line, tell me what you think about what we're doing. Visit our website. You can follow me on Twitter, A-V-I-K. You can, we have a substack, substack.freeop.org that you can, you can go to and you can subscribe to if you want to catch up on what we're doing. And all sorts of areas. We've talked a lot about healthcare and COVID. We do a lot of stuff in education. We do a lot of stuff in broader economic policy, financial regulation, criminal justice reform, trade. Um, I mean, we've got a lot and an amazing team of scholars. Uh, I would love to, uh, to introduce them to you. Fantastic. Ovik, thank you so much for everything you're doing and for talking with me today. You too, Alexander. This has been great. Same to you.